my relationship with my father was, uh, uh, as I said before, was am as ambivalent uh, and, and in many ways difficult, even though he was my life's hero. But it's difficult to grow up in the shadow of someone else, which is what was happening. He, he overshadowed all of us. Yes, this is correct. Yes. There was, there was much of him. There was so much of him. The whole house was him. I mean, it was all about him. And did we have a lot of conversations in Yiddish? I think we did. Well, somebody. this was a problem, you see, and I was going to talk about that at some point. He would speak to me. See, you're a different generation, so I don't know what went on with the Yiddish with you. But he spoke to me in Yiddish, and I answered in English, and this, it, this could not, he could not change it. And I thought a lot about this, what, what was behind it with me, because I knew I could, I could have spoken Yiddish to him, but I didn't. I just never did. Never. And it was terribly upsetting to him, very frustrating. I think mostly, now that I think about it, the conversations were unilateral. He would speak Yiddish, and I, for the most part, spoke English, maybe throw in a few Yiddish words. I think I was nervous that he would know that my Yiddish was grammatically incorrect in some way or other. Uh -huh. And so, and my English was better than his, even though his was excellent. And so was mine. <laughs> I, I think I was being spiteful. I don't think I was worried about... Uh -huh. Yeah, I think this is my way of having some power, was that I could speak English and he couldn't stop me. Here I was, late in life, child, and the Mazinka, and they didn't know about babysitters. There was no such thing as a babysitter. I guess when my, once my sister married, for sure, there wasn't going to be anyone taking care of me in the house. So I got schlepped around everywhere. Every meeting they went to, I went to. Every occasion, I mean, things that had absolutely bored me to death. But everywhere I went, I was Dr. Simon's daughter. And so uh, that was something. I liked his stories, but as my son David has reminded me, I did not read his books, even the children's books. I was very rebellious. I mean, my father was a big figure, and it was very hard to always... You know, I was, I was meek, and, and yet somehow I managed, in, even with my meekness, to uh, make sure that he knew that he couldn't push me around. <laughs> I remember him reading his stories to me with a scotch in one hand and a cigar in the other hand. He was a little bit of a, of a kind of a fireplug kind of guy. Looked like the older generation of what you think of as New York Jews. He always wore a suit. I'm not sure I can ever remember him not being dressed in a suit and a tie. So from my little boy's standpoint, he was just my grandfather, right? So kids don't really think in comparing people. He was short, he wore a suit, he smelled of cigars and whiskey. He was ancient to me. Of course, now both my parents are well older than he was when he passed away. He was energetic, so loving towards, he's so delighted in his grandchildren. My existence was just a source of delight to him. From pictures or sketches and a vague memory, I'd say he had dark hair that was sort of peppery black and silver, uh, kind of stocky. He chewed juicy fruit gum and he smoked cigars. And it's funny because if I smell either, I think of him. He had uh, kind of dark blackish hair with a mustache greenish eyes, greenish gray eyes, which my mom got the gorgeous green turquoise eyes. He had four fingers on his left hand. That's another striking thing when you're a child. He was such a storyteller. So I would say, Zadie, what happened? Why do you only have four fingers? And every time I asked him, he would tell me a different story. One time he would say, oh, I was working in the fields. You know, I grew up in a, you know, a very rural place and I was working in the fields and I was uh, using a pitchfork to shovel some hay and I dropped the pitchfork and it just cut my finger clean off. And I didn't know. I never knew until, I think until after he died, I never really knew why he had lost his finger. And actually the, the way he lost his finger was, was also taka interesting, um, right? He lost his finger because he was a dentist. And he used to hold the x-ray film in his patient's mouth with one hand and take the x-ray with the other. And so this hand would get exposed to the x-rays. 
and he got cancer in his fingers. And, you know, people didn't know that x-rays were carcinogenic when they first came out. And so he got cancer and then he had to have surgeries and eventually got it uh, amputated. And, um, you know, to someone who now, you know, a dental office is also, you know, you've got these big machines with the long arms and then they either, they, they put lead on you and they leave and the idea of someone sort of holding it in and taking the, you know, that's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting. You know, that's how they used to do it. And it wasn't just that the finger was missing. His, his hands, his fingers were somewhat deformed as well. He had lost the fingernails um, in that hand, or at least on two of the remaining fingers, and the little bits of fingernails still stuck on or something, which was, you know, for a small kid was a little weird. I know he was frightening to a lot of children. He was booming. He was very booming. And I have a, actually, I have a cousin, Barry Lampert, talks about how frightening daddy was to him. Very frightening, that because he boomed, things came out unexpectedly out of him and loud, and it was like, you know, and like for a little kid, you know, that's a little difficult. You really weren't aware of what he looked like because he came across with such energy, mental as well as physical power kind of radiated from him. One of the things I associate with him, and I think that probably everybody associates with him, is an argumentative style. You know, he was opinionated um, and he enjoyed sort of intellectual jousting. He took children very seriously and so he would talk to you like a person. And when you were four or when you're eight or whatever it was, he would talk to you um, like if he was interested in what you had to say. He loved children. He absolutely loved children and he loved to tell stories. The other thing my son David remembers about him is when he got his Yiddish typewriter, that was about 1960, what David remembers, how fast he managed to type with like three, four fingers, even with this missing finger somehow he managed, but it wasn't touch typing by any means, it would, but he said he was as fast as anyone could possibly be. I mean, there's, there's, they don't stray far. There's still a connection, I think, with Dr. Simon's grandchildren. There is a connection. He loved children. He was a very warm and loving grandfather. I don't remember fighting with him ever about anything. He was just a very doting, loving grandfather. That's how I remember him. Because so I have to remember, I guess I was 12 or 13 when he passed. I think I was 12, so it's really young. But he may, I remember a lot about him, so. He made quite an impression. Zadie, he was really not like a religious Jew, even though he wrote um, for rabbis and he studied the Bible. I mean, I would actually love to talk with him. My interest as an adult has gotten really more into yoga and the eight limbs of yoga and the yoga philosophy. And I see what comes up a lot are like the teachings of other prophets. And I don't have like a Jewish yogi that I can talk with. The experience of getting to know someone whom I love but who is dead is a very strange and wonderful thing. It's a one-way relationship, obviously. He's getting nothing out of this. Um, but uh, although, you know, my mother says, oh, he would kvel if he, yeah, okay, but we don't get to kvel after we die. I mean, you, you're sort of the collection of, of a lot of things, right? So he was a real presence. He was. He was um, a presence because he was loud at times. He was a presence because he loved his grandchildren and he connected with us. Um, he was a presence because of what, you know, the Yiddish side of things, which really came from him more than any other one person. Um, you know, you don't know how much of your personality comes from who. It's, you know, it's hard to measure. But uh, I certainly see aspects of him in me in terms of um, just intellectual proclivity and not so much the scholarly thing and, and reading because in, in many ways he and I are opposites in that way. I always hated school. 
I hated school learning. I don't think I was particularly good at it and wasn't particularly motivated by it, which is really very different, I think, from, from him. Uh, but uh, in terms of having a logical mind, I think that he was very much that way. And so I see that in myself. And that he was, again, like this character with different dimensions, like that man who was a retired dentist giving candy out to neighborhood children who would run up to him, Dr. Simon, Dr. Simon. And whereas he maybe embarrassed me at times by his effusiveness, others, others seemed to enjoy that about him. So it was, he was interesting. So it was, it was warmth and it was stimulating, intellectually stimulating and a lot of positive emotion there. So I think about him a lot because I feel like his values that he transmitted, I think he was right. And I, I think about him all the time. I just, um, what like messages he was trying to convey.